Okay, but now you know the drill. Any your questions? I have uh, one question from someone who um, wanted to remain anonymous, but uh, he said uh, that uh, feels kind of guilty. He says he prefers Puccini to Bach, and uh, I think he's a little spiritually nervous now. Is there hope for that? I have, I, um, do you think a century from now they'll look back and consider us lunatics? I was thinking as you were talking about the meaning of music and um, what came to mind is Leonard Bernstein did that the TV series, you know, in the 60s. Yeah. And he famously said, music has a meaning. But he later changed his mind. Oh, really? Yeah, if you read uh, the, um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Because I actually uh, did an interview recently with, uh, in fact, I'll give a little plug for Marcel Love Your Joe. Yeah, I'm <laughs> get to that. Because uh, I've been, I, with, with my uh, post heart attack incentive, to, uh, I've been doing more interviews about music, and particularly about the nature of musical meaning. And uh, there's a book, and I'm blanking on the name of the author, I'll think of it in a second. I'm having this blackout all the time, uh, called Absolute Music. And there was an idea that emerges, actually, by, a, and you'll like this, by an adversary of Wagner. Well, that's a Wagnerian term, isn't it? Uh, no. The person who coined this, well, he may have used the term to say something he didn't like. Yeah. I think he may have used that. Because for Wagner, the Gesamtkunstwerk, of, 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 that, that music had, had all of this, uh, Emotional, political, historical resonance, and he wanted he wanted all of that. And 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 there was a music critic who said, no, 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 no. Music is purely formal, like a mathematics, and it has no meaning outside of itself. And the, the music and, and the term absolute music is developed, or pure music. That that the highest form of music is music that is entirely irrelevant to, to everything else. And out of that. Uh, a number of musical movements emerge, but that, they, that, that doesn't necessarily give rise to any particular musical form. Uh, but Bernstein is at the tail end. Bernstein had been trained when that was still the, uh, the dominant uh, theory. And so, yeah, I've seen, in fact, that's in the very first, the very first show of uh, the Young Person's Concerts. In fact, I used to have it on my iPad because I'm I used to, I actually showed it to, I played it for the, the, the uh, guy who was interviewing me in this book about absolute music, and he had never seen it, and he didn't realize Bernstein was kind of exhibit A of this idea that musical meaning is entirely hermetically sealed, and it means something within music, but it doesn't have resonance. In other words, it doesn't have metaphoric application to anything outside of itself. So, for instance, uh, what, what we think of as an ascending scale, a scale that goes up, there's no upness in it. There's, we use that metaphor uh, to say da 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 is an ascending musical line. Actually, the metaphor of upness is used in every language and culture around the world, oddly enough. And I think that actually this is an instance where It's not an arbitrary, it's not an arbitrary uh, likeness. It's not a, what happens in a meta, in, in an ascending scale, or to say that this note is higher than that note, is not just a kind of convention that, that, that's been applied arbitrarily. But I think that in fact, in the experience of what music is, God has given us a sensation of ascending. It, it's, it's, we are predisposed in some way, and the world is predisposed, so that that metaphor, remember I quoted Lewis who says that the, the metaphoric likeness between light and goodness and between dark and evil. Well, I think that the metaphoric likeness between what we call an ascending scale and the idea of ascent, um, listen to settings of the, of the credo of the mass at, at resurrection, this section in the creed where he, 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 Christ is raised from the dead. Uh, they often have ascending scales. Uh, something's going up, or and certainly when, uh, if, if you sing music written for the Feast of the Ascension, 
There's always ascending scales there. Well, that again, that's not just a convention. Now, interestingly, um, it was the uh, the lectures he gave at Harvard that were published in a book called The Unanswered Question, the Norton lectures at Harvard. I couldn't remember the name of the lectures. Where, and he'd been doing reading in uh, Noam Chomsky, I think. He'd been doing reading in uh, people doing work in linguistics, and he really reversed his position. By that time, it was, it was unfashionable to continue to hold on to that, the view that he had uh, earlier anymore. So that's, yeah, that, there was this little moment in modern Western history when there was a strong, strong assertion uh, of, of the essential, um, th that musical meaning had no reference to anything outside of itself. But, but that's pretty much been, been pretty much been abandoned. Okay, that's where Bernstein was going. Okay, we have some questions here. As you noted, the idea of objective beauty is unpopular even among Christians. How can I lovingly initiate the conversation? Would you recommend a book to share with a friend? With a friend? Uh, I think, but, because the, the, the implication is always, I'm a snob. Oh, yeah. I'm saying, you should right. listen to that, listen to this instead. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> so why, why, would, why would it be assumed that, I mean, I know, I know that, in fact, taste has been used to, uh, taste has been used, and for hundreds of years, if not longer, as a, uh, as a device to uh, ostracize people or to, uh, to, to render them inferior or, or outcasts in some way. And, that, and I think that probably most associated with, um, with uh, experiences, I, I think of principally in high society or in, in the, at, at, at court, uh, where, um, where uh, but, but interestingly, um, taste in those snobbish settings uh, was often tied at more to fashion than to objective standards of beauty. Now, again, standards of beauty themselves ebb and flow, but they're not entirely flexible. But, but so even what is regarded as beautiful at any given moment in history does have, or in any given culture, there is some flex. There's some flex to the introduction of the polyphony of harmony. Yeah. So oh yeah. Yeah. Well, in the introduction, yeah. So I want to get too theoretical. In the introduction of, of harmony. But one of the things that happened in, in in music history between the Middle Ages and the Reformation is that. Uh, Music being one of the quadrivium, one of the four, in a sense, numerical arts with uh, mathematics, geometry, and astronomy. Uh, a lot of music was written to fit a kind of numerical purity. And it, it didn't have to sound good. Uh, and um, so, for instance, a major third uh, on a keyboard between C and E, for instance, which is a, the, the center of most modern Western harmony. Major third was not uh, respected very much, partly because it, 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 for reasons having to do with uh, physics and the overtone scale, I mean, perfect fifths, perfect fourths are, are much, are intervals that have a, a greater purity to them. And so a lot of music was composed, in a sense, it, it, it wasn't a matter of whether or not people actually liked the sound. It was whether the sound conformed to a mathematical notion of order. And what happens, I think it's an important discovery in the late medieval, medieval period, early Renaissance, is, uh, and through the Renaissance, an idea that, uh, that actually, um, well, let me maybe call it a less Gnostic understanding of beauty. So that the beauty wasn't just a kind of formal perfection, but the, the beauty was actually something experienced orally, experienced through the senses. Uh, again, we would think, of course, music is experienced through the senses, but uh, in, for a thousand years, music is, is more of a kind of theoretical, theoretical practice. So, uh, so back to the question. Yes. So, loving it. Um, uh, I, Unfortunately, I can't think of any 
book. I can't think of any book that walks people through an argument who, who, who insist. Uh, and, and part of it is I don't think most people who accept, who accept the idea that, that judgments of beauty or any aesthetic judgments are entirely subjective, uh, I don't know that people have concluded that. I don't know that that's the result of an argument, that, and, and that's not the conclusion of an argument that has major and minor premises. I think they assume it. And it's really hard to disprove to someone uh, the, the falsity of something that they, that they haven't arrived. It, it, it's not logic that got them there in the first place. So I wonder whether it's logic that's going to get them away from it. Um, I think most people, uh, I think most people at some level have, have some sense that some things are more beautiful than others, or more accomplished than beauty. Than beauty. Uh, but again, even if they have that sense, that doesn't, they'll say, well, that's just me. There's no, no objectivity to it. Um, I, I think, I've actually, I've, the, 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 the approach I've been taking for a while has been, rather than talking about beauty or good and bad, is to actually talk about meaning, to talk about musical meaning, which isn't, which isn't, well, in a sense, you, you, you avoid the charge of snobbery, uh, in a sense. So basically, to try to get people to, uh, to experience the nature of musical meaning by listening, listening closely, or by singing or participating in music. And when they begin to perceive the structure in a form, uh, I think that they're more, more open than to, to actually hearing arguments about quality. I tell you, there is a book, um, there's a, a book called, uh, and I have to look up the author again, uh, two books by the same author. One is called uh, What Makes It Great, and the other one is called All You Have to Do is Listen. Anybody know who I'm talking about offhand? Just one second. This is why technology can be our friend. Uh, uh, Robert Capilo, K A P I L O W. What makes it great? And that's the one I'd recommend first because what he does, the, the subtitle is Short Masterpieces, Great Composers. What Capilo does in this book is, uh, and he had a series of lectures that used to be some of on, on YouTube or I, iTunes, uh, and I don't think they're there anymore, uh, where he walked people through a, a, a piece of music. And he, so he would take a particular musical phrase, and so he'd play a particular harmonic progression of, of six chords that really just nailed it. And then he'd say, okay, now, we all feel something's really happening. And they said, well, let's just change a few of those chords. Here's my inferior version of it. He would always say, here's my very inferior version of these same six chords. And he would change just a few notes and play it. And it just sounds so lame. And, and everybody, everybody feels, oh, that's, that's just not as good. It just doesn't work as much. Or he, I heard him give a, uh, give a discussion of, of a setting of Ave Maria by uh, Palestrina. And he first went through the Gregorian chant. Uh, the, the motet was based on the Gregorian, a, a Gregorian chant said in Yeah. Ave Maria. Yeah. That's how it starts off. And uh, so he has these guys on stage, a uh, male ensemble named Lionheart from Manhattan, and they sing this line of Gregorian chant. And he says, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Now let's change two notes. And, 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 and see how lame it is, basically. And then he, he, he has them sing it with the two notes changed. And everybody knows that's not as beautiful. The, the, so they realize that there's something missing there. And he doesn't try to quantify what it is, what's missing. So it's the experience of the thing. And so what, what he has perfected is a way of, uh, exam by, by way of example through comparison with inferior, it's only slightly different but inferior expressions of something very, very similar. He does this consistently. So I think that something like that, 
I think some kind of experience like that, rather than reading and arguing, it, it is, is really necessary for people to be moved to the point where they're willing to acknowledge. Because in that case, it was the movement of two or three notes or one or two chords. It was an objective thing that produced an almost universal response um, of, uh, among the people there that one clearly was more accomplished. Let's not say more beautiful, let's say more accomplished. I'm looking on my iPad, I want to share something with you. I decided not to ask for a screen uh, and, and, and uh, slides, but there are, uh, often when I lecture on uh, on the nature of musical meaning, I, I, I use slides and, and uh, I'm going to, uh, because I, I think one of the other things to, uh, to overcome is the, um, the prejudice, not that beauty is subjective, but that form is meaningless, okay? People think form doesn't mean anything. Okay, I'm going to, this is my, the closest I've come to PowerPoint here today, if I don't fall down. Okay, so how many of you can see these two Forms. Can you see the shapes here? This is part of a, uh, an experiment in visual perception that originates, I think, in the 20s. Uh, this is a slight variation on it. And, and participants in the study were shown these two forms. And participants who's from different language groups, not all speaking the same language, were shown these two forms, and they were asked which of these forms would you relate to Kiki? And which of these forms would relate, you relate to Booba? Okay. <laughs> one of these is named Kiki, and one of these is named Booba. And which one is Kiki, and which one is Booba? And, and, and like 95% of the people say, this is Kiki, and that's Booba. Okay, is that what most of you thought? This is Kiki, and this is Booba. Everybody knows that. <laughs> so, and they've done this with, with different age groups, with people from different cultures, different linguistic groups, and it's a universal response. It's a universal response. And it, it, this is one of many uh, devices you can, you, can, you can point to where, where there's a kind of unlearned well, I, I guess it's unlearned. No one told you that that was key. Okay, that's, it's unlearned in that sense. And I think there are reasons why that's the case, and it has to do with the, nature, the metaphorical nature of meaning. Because there's something that sounds, dare I say, round in booba. Sounds round. And probably there's something in the shape of your mouth, booba, if it's more mouth, you say, ooh, it's, it's round. And kiki is, is, it feels sharp, okay? We have a kind of synesthetic response. Synesthesia is when different senses kind of cross the wires. And you have, you, 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 you know, there are people who hear, uh, who hear colors, okay? In this case, uh, we, we, we have a, a, a sense that there's a metaphoric likeness. There's a likeness between the sound of kiki and what our face does when it says the word kiki, and what our face does at the sound of booba. Now that's, did you get to see the images? You didn't get to see the images. You may disagree. Do I like, but I like the tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the, uh, there, again, there are lots of ways that I think you can begin to introduce the idea of the meaningfulness of form, and the fact that something that has visual form could also have a kind of a sense of linguistic. Now, the interesting thing to say it's meaningful. The, the word kiki is, is itself a nonsense word. But so part of, part of what I'm trying to do is expand what do we mean by me? It sound like Bill Clinton here. <laughs> uh, what do we mean? That's kind of a bold joke. People are certain. Uh, meaning doesn't just take linguistic or propositional. And I think that uh, that's that's something to overcome also. So so the meaningfulness of form, in order to get there, you have to say well meaning can, meaning doesn't just uh, refer to propositions. 
I was thinking too. I mean, the, the example you gave this one gentleman who wrote the two books. Yeah, yeah, Bob Kaplan. So uh, I think one of the things I really got from the Dr. Wilson book is that the, the best teacher is one who loves the students and the, and the material. So when someone who loves music shares that love, yeah. then you know, rather than a series of, of propositions and here's yeah. why you should prefer yeah. this to that, or, or here's why you're wasting your time to right. yeah. yeah. you know, to, to, to bring them along. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. I also think, if I can say this, that, that there's an institutional responsibility here. Because I, I came to love the music I love. and came to recognize it, what I think is uh, its greatness. And, and uh, accept ideas of hierarchy of, of greatness. Uh, hier hierarchy of accomplishment. Uh, because I had teachers and, and choir directors at church who establish a sense of standards and hierarchy, and without apology, they didn't. They didn't. Um, they didn't look down their nose at the kids for what they were, what their untrained tastes were. But the, but they basically, they, neither did they cater to that taste in in the choice of music for the concert choir or. So there was there was a, there, they were in positions of authority, and they basically. They realized that their task was to be there to form the taste of their students. There's a great line from Flannery O'Connor when she was addressing a, a, a class of uh, English teachers about the curriculum. I didn't tell this story last night, did I? and uh, I, I get to a point where I forget what stories I've told. Uh, and and, and uh, she's saying, Here's, ha, here are criteria for selecting the books that kids should read. And, 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 and she says, well, some people might say, well, what if, what if what if this? What if these books are not uh, don't accord with the taste of the students? And she says, "Well, that's that's sad, but the students' tastes need not be consulted; they are being formed." So, so the, the very you know this is a shocking thing to say, but she basically says, "Well, why should teachers worry about that? Their job isn't to cater to the taste; the job is to form the taste." Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that, she says this in the 60s. Uh, she also says at one point in that, she says uh, that she hopes that one of, the, one of the main tasks of an English teacher is to improve the quality of the books on the bestseller list. <laughs> she says that may be setting the bar too high or too low. She wasn't sure what it was. But, but so, so basically, the idea of informed taste and shape taste I think that at some point in my lifetime, people in positions of cultural authority stopped uh, uh, asserting or expressing that authority with regard to questions and taste. Because authority is questioned. Well, authority itself is questioned, yeah. Um, uh, if a person's opinion on music is subjective, can the music, can the beauty of music be objective? Is beauty an objective truth? Yeah, I, I have to confess that, uh, first of all, I, I, I want to I say that the, the, the language of objective and subjective, I'm not entirely happy with that. Because I think there's a sense in which music is profoundly subjective, because we can only know music as subject. So, uh, so I don't want to say that music is just objective. Uh, what I would say is that music, and, and I think music does express inner, inner states. But, but, it, but it doesn't just, it, I think it, it's better to say that, uh, uh, okay, if all of us have a sensation of ascending, when notes are going up, if I want to express a subjective sensation and convey that subjective sensation of ascent or getting happier or something, I need to respect the givenness of, in, in acoustic experience. I need to expect, respect what you might call the objective experience of ascending in music as I'm trying to convey my own subjective experiences and have them received by other people subjectively. So I, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna make objective meaning what's really there. 
and subjective uh, pitted again. That is our perception of what's really there. I don't want to pit them against each other. So, so what? How, how was that question working? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had several questions about it. The person's opinion on music is subjective, and the beauty of music is objective. Is beauty an objective truth? Yeah, and I don't, I'm not even sure I would say an objective truth. Um, I would say that there are things that are objectively true about music, uh, and maybe maybe you could talk about it as a truth. Um, there, uh, and I don't want to. I also don't want to dispense with the idea of, of differences in tastes. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think there are, are hard and fast rules that um, the fact that there, that that musical meaning is objective. Uh, well, again, uh, maybe I could get around this whole question by doing what Jeremy Bankby does. And he says, when I start talking about music, people immediately ask me, well, tell us about what music you like. And he says, that's, that's not important. What I like and what you like isn't really important. And so it's interesting that often when we talk about this, uh, it, it becomes reduced, uh, dis discussions about music become kind of hung up on questions of, I like this, you like that. And, and again, that seems to me, that's not me. Uh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> what not to do. My apologies. You know, I, I often say, um, I, I conduct a small choir, and, Every now and then, a choir member might say, "I really don't like this." That we'll, we'll start a new piece of music, and they'll say, "I don't like it." I said, "You don't understand it well enough to not like it." Uh, and I, I'm not being coy or anything. I, I don't think that's the case. I think I'll confess one. I like the Beatles when I was a young person, yeah. I mean, especially the early stuff. It's, it's you know, it's oh, oh yeah, there was a lot of stuff I liked, yeah. But, but yeah, it takes more work to. Well, appreciate. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of music I like. I mean, I won't. I, I mean. Well, there's, 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 uh, just within classical music, there's music that I liked as a younger person that I begin to realize, well, that's, yeah, that's okay. It's, but, 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 and I remember the first time I ever heard music, uh, a Renaissance uh, music from, from Venice, like Gabriella music. And I remember saying to uh, the person who was playing for me, who, who I ended up singing in a group with in school. I said, this all sounds alike to me. And he just shook his head. <laughs> well, oddly enough, years later, this is actually a story I, I told in my book, uh, th that very music by Gabrielli, there was a, a recording, a famous landmark recording that came out, recorded at St. Martin's Cathedral in Venice, of music uh, by Gabrielli for organ, brass, and choir. It's, it's, it's just astonishing stuff, and glorious stuff. And, so when I was in college, there was a girl I was uh, sweet on, and, and uh, she was over at my parents' house, but we had dinner together, and I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really impress her if I play her some of this God reality. Yeah. And this is the very music that, you know, four or five years ago, six years earlier, I thought it all sounded like. Why I didn't remember that, I don't know. <laughs> so I play this music, and I'm thinking, she's just gonna be so, we were just having this wonderful epiphany moment. And, uh, so as the, as the reverb is dying out, and, and I'm sitting there just in seventh heaven, she says to me, do many people like this sort of thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was kind of a sign. <laughs> I think this would be the last question, and it's hard. There's several good questions here, so my apologies to those who took the trouble. Uh, can you say that your concerns about the relativity of music uh, those concerns are relevant to all the fine arts? Well, it, to, to a greater or lesser extent, and the reason, and, and I, that, that, it, that's a good question because I wanted to underscore something that, that we have, that none of the questions raised, and that is, um, historically, the concern about musical meaning was very much tied up to the stirring of the passions. 
And so it's not just a question that I'm, it's not just that I'm concerned about wisdom in making aesthetic judgments, but I'm concerned about what does music do to us and are we recognizing what it is that music does to us? And are we recognizing what music does as music, not with the lyrics, to our children? Because I think, uh, and, I, and this isn't just popular music versus classical music by any means. I think all forms of all forms of music have areas or where they get uh, where they may incite passions which are disproportionate. Uh, you know, the whole point of of uh, Augustine's idea of the ordo amoris uh, of an ordinate ordinate affections, that is well ordered. It's not just that you should like the right things, but you, you should give them the amount of love that, that is due to them. So there's some music that, that I like this much, and there's some music that I like this much, and some music that I like this much. So, so, and part of it is a recognition of the accomplishment that's there. So if I can, if I can attune my love so that I'm recognizing something that's actually present in the music, Respond to it, um, and and you know this is this is part of you know any person's education. You know, you, I first encountered Gabrielli. I didn't like it. It's not that I disliked it, but uh, but I didn't know how to like it. And and, and I, but but I have people who tell me you should like this more than you do like it. It's also possible to like it more than I should like it. And so. Um, but, but I think the, the reason I'm, I'm probably more concerned, well, two reasons I'm more concerned about music, partly because of the fact that it's, it's the area that gets the least amount of critical attention. I mean, I've been at conferences where people smirk and sneer at Thomas Kincaid's paintings. And then go ahead and sing the, the musical equivalent of Thomas Kincaid's paintings <laughs> without batting an, an earlash or... <laughs> Uh, what is that? That's it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, I, and I get, I get confused with that. I'm, I'm confused with that because music enters into our bodies and spirits more thoroughly than, than, than a painting does. We can have a, a really deep response to a painting. I mean, the fact, you know, somebody said, well, music hits us that way because we have eyelids and don't have earlids. We, we can't choose not to listen to music that's around us. So there's a certain sense in which we're captive to music. But also, I think it's even deeper than that. The fact that, uh, that music makes our bodies vibrate. And then when you and I are singing together, we're making each other's body, body vibrate, which is kind of weird. Um, so there's an intimacy, and, 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 and I, I think I said, uh, music has a way of inhabiting us while we're inhabiting it. So there's a co-inhabitation, which I think is actually analogous to the way we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And I think that that dynamic of inhabitation is present in the experience of music in ways that it's not present in the visual arts or in, or, or in literature and other art forms. Would you agree? I, I, I wonder, music is, there's something evanescent. When, when yeah. we're singing it, like it, it, that, that mumble will never begin. I yeah, look at that yeah, painting, right. right. Like it, yeah, yeah, it hasn't yeah. changed. Right, right. Or yeah. a work of architecture. Right. Music's the only one. It, it'll never be exactly the right. same. Never be exactly the same. And, and but, 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 but and also, very interestingly, and this is why music has a lot to do with time and our, and our experience of time. So, yeah, so we sing, we sing this piece, or we hear a concert, we hear a performance of the piece. We'll never hear it perform exactly like that. Lot. I mean, could be recorded. Um, but uh, so th th there is an evanescence. But but there's also, and I don't know if this is exactly a paradox or not. Uh, I feel this a lot when my choir is singing music. In, in a couple weeks, maybe next week, we're going to sing a piece written about 1430, and, and by Josquin de Pray, uh, and. I have, I have a sense when we're doing this music that it's been it's been resurrected in some way. That that the music that was alive in 1431 was written and sung. That we're now giving it a, a life now. And so there's a sense in which each performance is evanescent, but there's a certain kind of 
perpetuity as long as the music has, has a particular work, a piece of music. And I think that's part of the power for, you know, we have, people have, people try to relive their youth in playing the music of their youth. Uh, sometimes rather pathetic, yeah. but uh, especially my generation. But uh, but there is a sense in which we we do relive something, but by, by through music, through reliving it through music. So it's tied to time and memory in, in remarkable ways. And so yeah, so on the one hand it's evanescent, it's just there and gone. On the other hand, it has this recurring capacity. That's also present in the form that music takes. So you hear a theme at the beginning of the movement of the symphony. Yes. And then suddenly the theme shows up again in a different guise. And then it shows up again later. And then suddenly the theme. So you have this, uh, uh, again, a recapitulation of, 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 of a theme that takes on a new meaning in the new context. So that, um, again, all of these, and I think these are all experiences that enrich our experience of time, enrich our experience of uh, spirituality, enrich our experience of relationship, which are lost. And I think music has a unique capacity to confer those possibilities. And one of the biggest concerns I have is, is the fact that it's not so much that, that people like bad music, it's that they don't have an opportunity to like great music. Because it's like with food, if you eat a lot of food that's really salty and has a lot of high fat content, there are some things you'll just never taste. There's some wonderful taste that you'll just never have access to. And, and I think that that's, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's the loss of the kind of glory that, that I think is, is tragic. And I think, the last thing, sorry. <laughs> the church, has an amazing treasure of music in its history. That is, I think it's one of the richest cultural treasures the church has to offer to the world. And, 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 uh, and most, most Christians are entirely unaware of this amazing uh, treasure. And, uh, and, and will live their whole lives without any kind of word. And it's, and it's I think it's, it's less and less calm, less and less likely Christians will, will have um, access to them. And uh, I just think that's a, that's a huge, a huge tragedy. So, anyway.